Hello and welcome to the House of Wellness. I'm Luke Darcy and I'm thrilled as always to be sitting alongside my great friend Joe Stanley. Hello, Joe. I'm thrilled as always to be here <laughs> with you, Dars. And if there's anything we've learned from this past year, in fact, it's a year since this whole pandemic started, can you believe that? It's that family and friends are pretty much everything. It's incredible the power of connection, Joe, and they say that people who receive emotional support during the six months after a heart attack are three times more likely to survive. When you think about that, people with connection and social support have mm. that much more of a chance of living. Yeah, that's why we're passionate about supporting social groups like Lip Timber, Time to Talk and Gotcha for Life, just to name a few. And in the UK, they actually appointed a Minister for Loneliness with the aim to connect older people especially. I love that. It's a mm. great, great initiative in the UK. Today, we're all about community and connection. We'll discover how a Melbourne woman's plan to brighten up her local area resulted in a relationship she never saw coming. Plus, we meet an Australian beauty queen whose involvement in pageants helped her battle the prejudice surrounding autism. They say it takes a village to raise a child, Joe, and that saying is never truer than when you're dealing with the heartache of illness. When your child is sick, especially seriously, having a strong network around you becomes the most important thing in your life. That's where our local health heroes come in. Some good friends of ours have a gorgeous three-year-old son called Raffi. Sweet little Raffi is battling a major illness with his parents, Matt and Nikki Verrocchi, right by his side. They're a very special family and we were fortunate enough to share in their story. In mid-November, Maddie and I um, started to realise that something wasn't quite right with Raffi. Mm. He was a little bit lethargic, um, didn't really want to go to the park. Just wanted to sort of sit around the house a little bit more so he wasn't that energetic, normal kid that he usually was. But we did suggest or did say that we noticed he had a bit of weight loss and the mm. weight loss thing really triggered something for our doctor. So Nikki bravely took Rafi in to get his first blood test into the children's. Um, yeah. It was 9am uh, on a Friday, on the Friday the 10th of December. <coughs> um, yeah. And by 3pm that afternoon, we'd been called back in and told to pack our bags for a considerable stay. Um, while further testing was done. The test results confirmed the unthinkable. Raffi had B cell ALL leukaemia. From that moment, our world was turned completely upside down. Um, you know, it just sort of broke us. Yeah, that was I mean, a it's nice... a big shock. I mean, mm. cancer's a really significant word in any situation, let alone when your three-year-old son's diagnosed with the disease. Um, and just from the get-go, the children's not only provide the instant medical treatment that you require, but I think the education's important. Families go in with no understanding of what they're going to face. Timelines, <laughs> treatment, how that treatment's going to affect their child, you have none of that. And the information does flow very quickly and it is a bit overwhelming at times, but um, it gave us a sense of strength and confidence that the children's had it under control um, and Rafi was in a good spot. After intense treatment in the Kookaburra Cancer Ward at Melbourne's Royal Children's Hospital, Rafi returned home. And how's Rafi now? Rafi is a completely different boy. He's amazing. He's just running around again. He's got his energy back. He's just our fun-loving little Rafi. Yeah, like, <laughs> incredible how much can happen in, in four weeks, you know. You, you, <laughs> You're told if his diagnosis, he has some intense treatments and then they tell you that he's cancer-free and, and it's all good, um, which is the most amazing result any parent wants and, you know, really wants to hear. So we're so grateful for that. Cheeky boy! So what was that time like for you when you were in hospital? Look, the Kookaburra Ward is an amazing... Um, part of the Royal Children's Hospital. Um, their support and care for families is just unquestionable and they'll go uh, heavens and above anything to make sure that your stay is comfortable and as it is enjoyable for the families and more importantly the children throughout your journey there. The guidance, the comfort and just the, the support that they've showed us along the journey and stepping us through the initial phases of Rafi's treatment has been pretty special. I mean, in times of uncertainty, 
their reassurance that our little boy was on the... So I'm, I'm going to go now. <laughs> um, our little boy um, was on the road to recovery. I think it, it, was, it, was, it really touched us and they've been a great support for us moving through it. You're fundraising for the Kookaburra Cancer Care Award and have already raised an incredible amount. Tell us about that. The Kookaburra Cancer Award provides unbelievable support to all families affected by cancer and all children affected by cancer. Um, we're a beneficiary of that support and Rafi has been lucky enough to have that support and care throughout his journey. And we wanted to make sure that, A, we raise awareness for the great job that the children are doing in that particular area of the hospital, but B, raise funds to ensure that families like ours can continue to receive the care and support they require because all those ex external stresses that you have, whether it's work and whether it's financial issues, paying bills, whatever that may be, that's all very evident to cancer families because they have to spend those hours bedside with their children, <coughs> making sure they're looked after and cared for. Um, and to eliminate any external pressures and, or assist with any external pressures is really important. Mm. So how can people donate? Yeah, so you simply can donate um, via the Good Friday Appeal website. Um, Rafi has his own fundraising page um, amongst many other kids. You can also volunteer your time, you can um, donate in other ways. Um, but I think that's all listed on the website. Yeah! You did it, buddy! We want Rafi to be a beacon of hope and positivity for all the vulnerable families that are going through similar situations or all the tougher situations. And if Rafi can be a shining light for them um, and something to not aspire to, but there's a, there's a positive story that they can take on um, if they have to confront a similar sort of situation, he's going to be OK. Um, he'll go through two years of hard work and, and, and uh, invasive treatment, but um, he'll be OK. And I think that um, if we can, you know, uh, provide that positivity to families going through what Rafi's going through. I think it's, it's a really positive thing. After the break, we pay a visit to the Kookaburra Ward and meet a couple of the frontline workers caring for the kids and the families who need it most. Back after this. Welcome back. Before the break, we met Matt and Nikki Varocchi, whose little boy Rafi was diagnosed with leukaemia back in 2020. And although heartbroken with the diagnosis, his family were very much comforted and supported by the Kookaburra Award cancer team at the Royal Children's Hospital right here in Melbourne, Joe. Following some intensive treatment and a lot of love and care, the great news is that Rafi is now leukaemia free with a very optimistic prognosis, which is just fantastic, Darth. Could not hear better news than that, Joe. Rafi still has more treatment ahead, but couldn't be in better hands. And we paid a visit to the Kookaburra Cancer Ward and met two special people who became very much a part of Rafi's life during his treatment. So when a child walks in the door, they're quite unwell when they present with acute leukaemia. So the first little part of their journey is actually on the ward in Kookaburra Ward where we start the treatment and we provide supportive care. So often they require blood transfusions, antibiotics, nutritional support, sometimes even pain relief. And when a child is diagnosed, a family's life just, I'm imagining, stops. What sorts of support do families need in that moment and for the weeks afterwards? So I think a lot of patients and families come from a background where they don't know anyone who's had childhood cancer. So the first thing to instill in them is good news in that the expectation is cure. So we've come a long way in 50 years from a disease that was essentially a death sentence to now a disease that is highly curable with, you know, more than 90% of our patients survive leukaemia treatment. So I think that's really critical to impart on the families in that first meeting because it is, as you say, an absolute whirlwind for them. Their world is turned upside down and just to have that glimmer of hope and knowing we have somewhere we're moving to. So I think we've got really good supports for the families. Um, 
You know, it's not just the nurses and the doctors, whilst the bedside nurses are incredibly important, it's the, the whole team, you know, from social workers to mental health to the therapists, such as the physiotherapists, the nutritionists. So it's a huge team that helps support the families. So you're working with young children, many of whom are very ill. How does that impact the way you go about your work? Obviously, you've got to have empathy and compassion and um, you need to have a sense of fun as well because they are kids and you need to know the latest games, you need to know the, the latest Peppa Pig or whoever it is at the time. But yeah, so we try and create a positive environment, try and make it as fun as possible, especially for the littlies. Um, and that includes the kinder sessions and art and music. Um, so yeah, make sure the days are not just filled with, I guess, you know, medications and interventions, making sure that we're continuing with their development as well. The cancer journey is not short. So most children with leukaemia receive treatment for over two years. And in that time, we are there every step of the way through illness, through wellness, through hard times, through better times. And we watch them grow as well because a child that presents at the age of two changes a lot by the time they finish treatment at the age of four or five and then following them through their development and progress off treatment as well. So we're getting to know these children over the course of their, their young lives until they transition to adulthood. How does it feel when a child recovers, like we see with Rafi? Yeah, I mean, it, that's why we do our job. You know, we see these kids and they're sometimes incredibly sick at diagnosis, but we do our job because we cure most children and it's incredibly rewarding. And our kids have um, an end of treatment bell and there's nothing better than seeing the kids and the families ring that bell. Oh, oh no! What they do at that hospital is incredible and it goes way beyond the medical treatment. When a child is sick, families have to put work on hold, they have to live apart from their families and children and give up everything really to spend endless days by a hospital bed. It's financially and emotionally exhausting. Yeah, Matt and Nikki Verrocchi know firsthand the toll it takes and have gotten behind the Good Friday appeal to make a difference to the community of sick kids and their parents. And if you'd like to find out more about Rafi's story or to donate, go to his fundraising page. You'll also find more details on the House of Wellness website. I tell you what, Joe, there is absolutely no better cause to me than trying to help our kids who are suffering and need all of the funds and attention we can give them. You're right, Darcy. Our kids are everything. Well, today is all about staying connected and becoming closer to each other. And one of our House of Wellness family members is the energetic Luke Hines. Here he is to make that true friendship drink a comforting cuppa, but with an exotic twist. Welcome back to the House of Wellness Kitchen, which today actually happens to be my very own kitchen at home, which is awesome because I get to whip up one of the delicious recipes I make on the daily to make sure that I'm healthy, happy and active. Now, I simply cannot start my day without a coffee and it seems that I'm not alone because Aussies are the number one coffee consumer in the world and our first choice is a latte. Today, I'm actually gonna show you how to make a turmeric latte, which is gonna kickstart your morning, but also look after those joints as you bounce out of bed each day. Turmeric can't take all the credit though. The secret is in the active compound in it, called curcumin, which is responsible for its vibrant yellow color and numerous health benefits, joint health being one. There's no wonder it's been used for thousands of years as a medicinal herb, and I am not missing out. For those of you who are active like me, curcumin will help support with joint mobility and stiffness as it has anti-inflammatory benefits. This is a great natural solution for those who look to manage their inflammation. It's also a great addition for those living with pain associated with mild osteoarthritis, which affects one in five Aussies over 45. Curcumin acts as a powerful antioxidant that helps fight against free radical damage that builds up in the body that can cause illness and aging. Two things I'll happily go without. Like many of my recipes, the ingredients rely on each other not only for great taste, but also health benefits, and curcumin is no different. Unfortunately, the active ingredient is poorly absorbed into our bloodstream unless we combine it with black pepper. If the flavour of turmeric isn't your thing or black pepper makes you sneeze, especially in the morning, I hear you. Don't worry, you don't have to eat turmeric to get the benefits of the curcumin in it. 
curcumin can be found in an easy and convenient supplement form, perfect for those on the go. Welcome back. One of the many things to go out of fashion and cop a fair bit of flack in recent years has been beauty pageants, Joe. Yeah, well, so most pageants these days thankfully focus not on beauty, but on qualities and skills such as public speaking and academia and community service, which is so much more inspiring, don't you think? Yeah, it was a couple of years ago, uh, Joe, that Miss America decided to end the swimsuit part of the competition and focus more on the contestants' life achievements, goals which signalled a pretty big change. Yeah, and... Look, there's nothing wrong with celebrating beauty, but to consider it a very diverse kind of beauty. But it's even more important to applaud women's leadership and business skills, their social and emotional intelligence and fitness and phys physical strength, you know, the list could go on. And in these fields, one local beauty queen is truly excelling. Her name's Laura Younger. She was diagnosed with autism when she was younger and experienced the prejudice that often that brings at that age. But rather than crumble, she found remarkable strength to prove that the real beauty comes from inspiring others to rise to the top. Check it out. To see Laura today makes it hard to believe the challenges she faced. At the age of 13, she was diagnosed with high functioning autism. As a little girl, I was very shy, extremely quiet. Um, I didn't really have a friend group in primary school. I kind of lived my life online, like I did in high school. So, yeah, very quiet girl. So how did you navigate school life? How did you get by? Yeah, I remember always being alone, <laughs> uh, sitting alone, maybe getting a basketball from the gym and playing with that. I mostly just studied. And then I would come home and live my life online, just play video games and... Yeah, like, I was very lonely as a kid, I think. And when you learned about autism, what sorts of things sort of fell into place for you? I would say why I had trouble socialising so much and making a friend. Things didn't get easier for Laura when she went to university. She started out studying nursing but was forced to quit because of her problems socialising. It wasn't until she changed degrees, studying IT and coding, a course that is much better suited to her type of autism, that her life began to turn around. I think changing degrees really um, changed my outlook on life and really gave me a meaning. And what other things have changed for you that mean that you're in a much happier place now? I have a really great girlfriend group, a really great girl group. Um, they always look out for me. I've never met any, like, I've never met kind of girls before and they're so lovely. Is it important for you that you are being a voice for people living with autism? Yes, I, I have so much empathy for people who have it a lot worse than me. Um, and I struggle already and I can't imagine what it would be like for someone going through what I've been through and having more struggles than I did. I just think it would be so difficult and I would love to be the voice for them. What would you say has really contributed to your boost in confidence? Uh, Miss Sweat Australia. <laughs> I did a modelling academy with them. They held a modelling academy where you learn to walk and you learn all, like, kind of etiquette. And I feel each time I compete in something, I grow a little more, but I feel like Miss World Australia especially has formed a sort of identity for me. Um, yeah, it's been amazing. And so now for Miss World, what's the next step? I am waiting for the announcement for the date of the state final, which hopefully I get through and go to the nationals which it'd be an amazing experience and opportunity to represent um, autistic women. Laura, you are truly one of the most inspiring people I've met. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank you so much. Well, Joe, what a great story that was. And autism is a word that we hear a lot about now. I've had uh, many close friends whose families are dealing with young kids who've been diagnosed with autism and it's something that 
is in our world every day these, these days. That's right. It is such a broad term, though, that encompasses a range of different personal experiences. And that's why autism is described as a spectrum. And here to tell us more is Professor of Psychology, Nicole Reinhardt. Hello, Nicole. It's lovely to have you. Hello. Thank you for having me. So, as we said, autism is a word that we hear a lot. But what exactly is it? So autism is a neurodevelopmental disorder, which means the brain is developing in a different way from typically developing children. It's characterised by three main areas of symptoms. One, social difficulties, for example, making friends or understanding what's going on in a social context. Two, communication difficulties, which might be verbal, um, having difficulty verbalising, or non-verbal, such as gesturing for things that a little kid might want. And the third area is rigid and repetitive behaviours, which can be everything from wanting to eat the same food every day to wanting to go to school in the same route. Um, and if, if a parent changes that route, the child gets very upset. And now you might say, well, we all have some social difficulties at time or problems expressing ourselves or we all like routine. Um, the difference here is that it causes enormous distress. So when our kids are really little, I think as parents, we tend to just compare them to everybody else. We always sort of yeah. live in that space where are they developing yeah. normally, normally, whatever yeah. that means. So how do we know what is normal for a child and mm -hmm. how do we know that we maybe need to investigate further? Yeah, so some of the key hallmarks of autism are not developing language, so not saying single words by 12 months and then developing into small sentences by two or three years of age. Unusual motor patterns, repetitive motor patterns um, that would um, not normally be seen in the course of typical development. Nicole, I've, uh, you know, got some great friends and beautiful young kids that I've spent a lot of time with now and I see them on the autism spectrum as having parts of their brain that fire almost perfectly in better yeah. ways and, and they're almost the most pure kids I've ever met. Mm -hmm. They've got beautiful empathy. Mm -hmm. Is that true that clearly other parts don't work so well? But do you see that with young kids with autism that in yeah. some ways they function better than whatever normal is? Oh, without a doubt. Um, I often say to young people that their brain is just wired differently and wired in different ways where they can sense the world in better ways than other people. Or, you know, I was talking to a, a little boy the other day and he'd already memorised all of the timetables at the age of five, which is extraordinary. I still don't think I know them all, you know? <laughs> How do you do that at five? <laughs> it's, it's remarkable um, that the skill set um, that young people have and, and the way, therefore, that we go forward is looking for their strengths yeah. and building on those strengths and turning those special interests and strengths into a future career yeah. or something that connects them socially, lights them up. Yeah. Is it important, then, to diagnose someone as being on the autism spectrum or is that perhaps a, a label that isn't useful? Yeah, no, it's useful um, mm -hmm. because we know that when young people have autism, life is a struggle. And um, there are some children who have less complex needs um, where parents are really caught, you know, should we, should we get a diagnosis, shouldn't we get a diagnosis? Um, what a diagnosis does is create understanding I use the analogy of a beautiful duck on a, on a pond and the duck's, you know, paddling like mad to stay afloat. Well, a child with autism has to paddle 1,000 times harder every day. Nicole, we hear about the early diagnosis, mm -hmm. early intervention. What, what are some of the treatments that help support uh, kids that are diagnosed on the autism spectrum? Yeah, so it really depends on what um, the young person's needs are. I often say to parents, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. Um, for children who have problems with motor coordination, occupational therapy, um, sensory difficulties that are creating a problem for them that they can't leave the house. Um, speech pathology early for kids who aren't speaking is incredibly beneficial. Um, and then later, um, speech therapy that focuses on pragmatics, which is the social use of language. So lots of young people can say a lot, can understand a lot, but you put that language into a social context and they're very confused. It seems as though the rate of diagnosis for autism is mm -hmm. increasing significantly. Yeah. In fact, the, the latest research says that it is. Have you got an understanding why? 
Yeah, so it affects about one in 100 um, Australians right now. We're just getting to understand the spectrum better. Back in the day, they were just seen as the quirky kids and nobody really understood their struggle. So we've got to understand those young people much better. Um, and that's super important because um, that group of young people have very high levels of mental health problems because they're living with this silent disability. People can't see it. They don't understand it. You know, it's the old pull your socks up, let's go. Well, they can't do that. It's too hard. So we understand that end of the spectrum now. And also we've got much better at understanding children with much more complex needs. So, again, back in the day it would have been this is a group of children with intellectual disabilities. We now know all the different types of disabilities and we can diagnose and identify it better. So, so we understand the spectrum more broadly. Every parent wants their kids to have the same opportunities in life, regardless of what's thrown at them. And Nicole's given us some great ideas around how we can support kids with autism. If you need more information, check out the Autism Awareness website. And as always, we appreciate you joining us. Thanks, Nicole. Thank you. Welcome back. Joe. a few weeks ago, I enjoyed the chat we had with Dr Nicole Milburn. She was talking about sleeping habits for babies. It took me right back to being uh, a new parent, having Sam being born. And we literally had the SOS and got someone to our house and said, we're in all sorts of trouble here. And she looked at the cot, which I had built on an angle, <laughs> and the pram, which I had assembled. Uh, and she was like, you guys have no idea at all. Well, it turns out he ended up sleeping and he's <laughs> grown. Like, look at him now. How old is he? He's 17, turning 18 uh, in a couple of months' time. And he is enormous, Joe. He's just... He's way past me. I think last count he was 204 centimetres, six foot eight and a half in the old. Wow. He is, uh, he's a big, big, tall unit, that It's young not fella. surprising, though, because you're tall, your wife Beck is tall. So, of course, he was going to be a tall... Boy, man. <laughs> yeah. um, but don't you think watching your kids develop and grow is just amazing? I just... My daughter's 12 and it is a privilege to see her just blossom and, yeah, every every month almost I turn around and I go, what, new shoes again? <laughs> How is this happening? It is fascinating to see. Sometimes over summer you feel like they come back and they've changed enormously. He did sidle up to me the other day and, uh, and said, do you want to have an arm wrestle? And I was like, of course I'll have an arm wrestle. How stupid of me. He beat me so convincingly, in the end he said, did you actually try? <laughs> so that, that ship sailed for me. Yeah. It's gone uh, way past. Don't take your son on, I guess. <laughs> but kids' bodies are working hard behind the scenes, which is why it's so important to give them the best possible start. But don't take it from us. We spoke to some very young doctors of the future for a lesson in kids' health. like a microphone. I say my smallest bone is in my ankle. I don't say my toe. Did you know you use more bones when you frown than when you smile, like this? Kids have lots of interesting theories about their bodies. And for naturopathic physician Angela Marie Smith, they can never be too young to learn how to keep their bodies working best. Kids require a, a lot more abundance in nutrition because they're growing so much. They're developing bones, their brain is developing, their neural system and nervous system is developing, their gut is developing, their immunity is developing. And I see nutrition as like the raw material, the, the foundations that you need to make a child. It's like building your house through your childhood. It's building the frame of your house, starting with a really strong frame. One, two, three, four, five, Six, seven, Forty. eight. <laughs> There's even one in your neck, you know. Calcium is a very important bone uh, mineral in that it helps to build strong, healthy bones and it also supports muscle contraction and is quite important for teeth formation also. And the two big standout nutrients there is uh, vitamin K2 and vitamin D3. And it's very easy for children to be deficient in vitamin D due to lack of outdoor activity and sun protection. Um, and vitamin K also works hand in hand with calcium to, to create strong and healthy bones and very vital for children. Well, I feel a real life well, brain. 
It looks like a pink b bowl that's cut in half in your head with a with small pipe and a bone coming down, making my tail. There's little things in it that are ideas and they go down a hole and come out of your mouth. That's how you say the ideas and think of them. The main key nutrients that are healthy for brain development is the essential fatty acids, omega-3, one of them being DHA. The DHA is particularly important for children, for healthy cognition, for learning, for memory, uh, for eye-hand coordination as they're uh, developing. It's an absolutely crucial essential fatty acid for the brain. In fact, it's structurally the major fat in the brain. So consuming enough or getting enough DHA through foods, through supplementation, certainly helps children to develop on an intelligence level, on a memory level, enhance their concentration and also mood. The cat is now happy. Eating a diverse range of foods is the ultimate way for children growth and development and then I urge probably most parents to look at supplementation with children because their needs are so high due to their growth and their brain and their bones and it is really difficult and a lot of expectation to put on parents to ensure that everything's being met all the time. Not every parent's a nutritionist, so they don't really know how to do that. So my first advice would be to look for Australian made and Australian owned, and then also looking on the label that there's no added uh, sugars, preservatives, colours, anything like that, that just sort of takes away from it being quite a healthy thing to add to their day to day. The reason why you have to be healthy is, it means don't eat any sugar things too much. It makes you strong and see in the dark. And what makes you see in the dark? Carrots. Help you learn? Yep. That's true, Lucy. You're getting the hang of it. Carrots make you see better. Anyone in the whole wide world know that? Well, here's one for the kids to ask. Have you ever heard of you use? I can't say I have, Joe. <laughs> What are you talking about? Okay, they are a colourful collection of mysterious creatures that have been popping up all over Melbourne, leaving many of us asking, what is this? Well, now I know what you're talking about. Have you seen I, them? I have heard about this, yes. They're UUs, art installations that are imaginary creatures. They're supposed to be a cross between a dugong and a wombat. Don't know why they've called them UUs, but why not? I guess they kind of look like you'd call it a UU, perhaps. <laughs> it, it sort of rolls off the tongue. They're absolutely adorable, though. Well, I think they're in aid of uh, supporting the Royal Children's Hospital and they're going to be auctioned off eventually, which is mm -hmm. a, gr a great thing. It's a quirky idea, that's for sure. I think there's around... I just there's 100 of them all around Victoria at the moment, gardens, laneways. I have heard people talking about uh, the mysterious UU. Yeah, they're absolutely gorgeous. It is the 150th anniversary of the Royal Children's Hospital, so what a great idea to keep the focus on the kids with an art trail. It's a UU hunt, <laughs> Daz. You can go out and find them. And I have to say, first time I saw it, I was in St Kilda on the beach there, and I was like, what's that? And then I saw it in Williamstown, which is on the other side of the bay, and then I saw it in the city, and I was like, mmm, I Try like what they're head... doing here. <laughs> Trying to get my head around UU. Interesting name, isn't it? You're saying cross between a dugong and a wombat. Mm. Could have gone dewbat. Or a... Yeah, sure. Gong bat, dewbat gong, wom gong. A few other <laughs> options. <laughs> I mean, it goes on and on. <laughs> well, you could just settle on UU. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to the new look House of Wellness Kitchen where the magic happens and I'm not just talking about the banter between GQ and I, it's where we create recipes that not only taste great but are good for you as well and today is all about mussels. I'm glad you've mentioned mussels, Hansi, because since we were last together, I've been working out in the gym every day. <laughs> I reckon I could give you a real run for money in the mussel steaks. I'm not talking about these mussels, GQ, I'm talking about the seafood variety. I want to focus today, though, on the green-lipped variety. Now, although I'm not using them, they're really good for your health. And I can explain their absence, Heinzi, because you and I are here in Australia, but green-lipped mussels come from the clear, pristine waters of New Zealand. And they get the name because, you guessed it, there's green colouring around the edge of the shell. And, mate, you weren't far off when you were talking about mussel health because green-lipped mussels actually help keep us active because they're a fantastic contribution 
to a healthy musculoskeletal system. That's because green lip muscles contain naturally occurring omega-3 fatty acids, as well as glycosaminoglycans, and they are important for improving flexibility and mobility in our joints, and they can also reduce the symptoms of mild arthritis and inflammation. Massive shout-out to the New Zealand Maori people who knew from very early on these were fantastic for your health. And shellfish, like New Zealand green lip mussels, Heinze, they contain antioxidants, which protect our body from free radical damage, and that's involved in illness and ageing. But we can get New Zealand green lip mussel in supplement form. That's going to save you and I the cost of flying to New Zealand. I actually wouldn't mind a trip over there, as long as you're happy to come and carry my bags. I'll come. I'm driving, because you can't drive. But just leave me some of those pan-seared mussels. Not a chance now. The A to Z of Vitamins is brought to you by Go Healthy. For superior supplement, for healthy energy and vitality, try New Zealand's number one premium supplement. Now available in Australia. Today's focus is on positive connections, Joe, and we all know that one of the great things that lockdown and restrictions brought, perhaps ironically, was bringing communities closer together. And Joe, you were really active in your neighbourhood. I love that you got out and uh, connected all the people close to your home. Are you still doing that? Yeah, we started a WhatsApp group during lockdown and we've made some of the best friends and we still are very, very active on that group. It's awesome. Yeah, there were so many fantastic stories of people trying to build those connections. We had teddy bears in windows, kids making stick figures and hanging them in trees and gardens. Lots of great stuff. Yeah, and remember our street dancer, Tony Yap, and putting out your rubbish in costume. I loved that one. Anything to get my ball gown out. <laughs> I mean, how creative and industrious were people? I just loved it. The ideas were coming thick and fast, Joe, no doubt about yeah, it. Yeah, and while most of us navigated our way through it as best we could, some of us did it tougher than others, like Tash Paraskevi from the inner city suburb of Coburg in Melbourne, who found her own way of getting through a dark time and got more than she bargained for in the process. At the beginning of last year, long before Melbourne went into lockdown, Tash Pereskevi was already going through an extremely challenging time. I had lost someone very, very dear to me. Um, so my partner passed away unexpectedly from a heart attack. And there was the stress of that, the emotional burden of that, as well as things that were happening with my own health as well. While grieving the loss of her partner, Tash was diagnosed with a heart condition of her own. I'd spent a couple of weeks in the CCU, the cardiac care unit, just surrounded by family and friends and people getting me through all of those, those moments. Somehow, Tash made it through her ordeal. So when lockdown hit, she was inspired to spread some positivity on the pavement of her local park. I wanted to help people that were going through those those anxieties, those stresses during a really uncertain time during lockdown. So to help them out and to sort of jolt them and wake them up that day a little bit or just to make them feel as though they're seen, needed and understood that they're not alone. Tasha's chalk messages soon became the talk of the inner city Melbourne suburb of Coburg, with locals stopping to thank her for the mental health pick-me-ups. They did mentioned things like thank you so much for that or I really needed it or some parents stopped with their children as well so some of the kids would grab a piece of chalk and start chalking with me which was really sweet and then they'd speak to us about their times during lockdown. There was one lady in particular who said that she was just emotionally and mentally not in a very good headspace and she was thinking about doing something regrettable and it was seeing those things that sort of jolted her into wanting to keep to, go, to strive for another better day, basically. So, yeah. One of the many people to be moved by Tasha's messages was 23-year-old baker Bruno Arena. I was a bit down um, during that time. You know, I was worried about uh, the family business and, um, you know, myself personally, like, am I gonna be able to get through this mentally during this time? I uh, went for a walk with my cousin and we came down to the lake and walked down the steps to the entrance and I see you are wonderful written on the ground and I go oh this is amazing who did this you know I was like oh blown away by it like this is awesome kept walking along the path and ended up seeing more and more messages written down like you are loved you are special you are unique I wanted to share it to as many people as possible so I wrote up a post on Coburg Gukama Network local Facebook group and I wrote, um, whoever did this, thank you so much. Uh, you definitely made my day and 
you know, made the day of many people walking through the lake, I'm sure. Bruno's Facebook post was instantly liked by hundreds of locals who shared his gratitude. Pretty soon, the message found its way to Tash herself. I'd commented on his post and he replied back and we did a bit of a to and fro. And basically I'd said to him, well, if you want to come out chalking with me, and he said, oh, my handwriting's really bad, but let's give it a go, sure, why not? A week after they started chatting online, Bruno and Tash met in person for the very first time. You know, I noticed the connection straight away when I, when I met Tash, I, was, I felt that there, that chemistry and, uh, you know, I guess it started as just getting to know each other sort of thing. And Tash, obviously, she's been through a lot, a lot going on with her health, a lot happening in her life. So she was a bit hesitant at first, but I pursued her and, um, you know, I guess uh, got her to fall in love, fall in love with me, you could say, but no, no, no. I'm glad that he pursued me. Even though I wasn't, I wasn't 110% sure that I was ready, I guess, for something, um, I'm glad that he pursued me. Yeah. Definitely. Welcome back. Before the break, we met the Melbourne couple who not only fell in love despite the pandemic and social restrictions, Joe, but because of it. Absolutely adorable. And speaking of all things love, if you don't mind a bit of romance, the National Portrait Gallery in Canberra has a new display called Australian Love Stories. Have you heard about this, Darcy? I haven't heard about Australian Love Stories, Joe. Well, it's got the lot, Darcy. It's got forbidden, enduring, platonic, scandalous, you name it. If there's a love story, it is there with a portrait to match. So it's all kinds of relationships, Joe. Is that right? Uh, did I read there's around 80 different stories that you can... Yep, Catch yep. Up on. there's portraits and stories of well-known couples like Brian Brown and Rachel Ward and Archie Roach and Ruby Hunter and even Kath and Kim. And if you can't get to Canberra, there's an interactive version online where you get to take part in a choose-your-own-adventure-style romance story. So check it out, because I'm feeling the love. <laughs> Good on you, Joe. That's it for today. Thanks for joining us. Head to the website, houseofwellness.com.au for more on our story on Rafi and how you can support the Royal Children's Hospital uh, great story today. Yeah, and don't miss the lift out in newspapers nationally this weekend with Australia's sunniest meteorologist, Magdalena Rose, on the cover. She's a champion of getting more girls into science and maths and, oh, she's one of my favourites. I love her. Yeah, great stuff. Remember to tune into the House of Wellness radio show every Sunday with Joe and GQ. And as always, thanks to our very good friends at Chemist Warehouse. We'll see you next time. See you.